Okay, so this next concept is called virtualization. Virtualization is a process of creating a software based version of something such as virtual apps, virtual servers, virtual storage, and virtual networks. So I'm going to give you a really basic understanding of virtualization to begin with so that you can get your head around the concept. Then we'll go into a little bit more detail. So a nice little example is what we have below where we've got a classroom. This classroom has different devices. So we've got a Windows machine. Let me just make this a nice bold color. So we've got a Windows machine. We've got an Apple machine. We've got another Apple machine. We've got a Samsung machine. We've got a Windows machine, an Apple machine, etc., etc. So everyone's using different hardware. Um, and that hardware will also have different operating systems. So Windows uses, well, Windows. I suppose. So really I should be saying this is a Windows machine, Windows OS. Let's imagine it's the hardware is a Dell. We've got a iPad and it's using um, Apple OS. Again, Apple OS. Another iPad. Samsung using a Android OS. So an Android operating system, etc, etc. So we've got another Windows machine, and let's say this one is a Hewlett Packard HP. So all these different hardware, different software. Then you've got this teacher at the front. <coughs> this teacher at the front wants to run a special app to help people code. The issue is everyone's got different hardware and different operating systems. So what I'm gonna do as a teacher is I'm gonna put on everyone's computer, let me just make this a bit thicker, what's called a virtual machine software. So it's like an app, software. It's called virtual machine software. So I put it onto here, I'm gonna put it here, virtual machine software, VM, virtual machine. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to make everyone have Windows 11 operating system. Even if you're on an Apple computer, you're now gonna be using Microsoft Windows all of them. I'm also then going to put my programming app, which is made for Windows, on all these machines. So I'm going to put P for programming app. That is now going to allow all of these people to run my education software, my programming app. Even though they're on different hardware devices, even though they're using different software, different operating systems. That is an example of virtualization. Does this computer, this Apple computer, really have Microsoft Windows on it? No, it's a virtual, a pretend, a fake, you can always say, version of Microsoft Windows. It tricks the Apple computer to believing it is allowed to run Microsoft Windows. And Microsoft Windows is actually running on top of the iOS. So you've got the iOS, running and you've got Windows which is running above that. Let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail. So let me just break this down into a little bit more information now. So we've still got a classroom where we've got let's say a TV screen, we've got a desk here, we've got a desk here, we've got a desk here. So we have little Joe, little Francis, little Bo Peep. Great. Same scenario, we've got the teacher who wants to put this app for coding on all these kids' computers. Virtualization. So, as we dis uh, discussed earlier, on this, we put on what's called a virtual machine. This allows us to put on like a different operating system onto these devices, which then allows me to pass the software on to these different devices. So that is the concept of a virtual machine. The benefit is really simple. A, I don't have to install the operating system on each one of these machines. B, if anything was to go wrong, and let's imagine that this kid started deleting things, really important system files, it only deletes the virtual machines 
operating system files, not the main device's operating system files. If there was a virus, so let's imagine that this person as a puts a virus onto this machine. It would only affect the virtual machine's operating system and not the main device's operating system. So it has increased security. It allows us to test things out. So I can put this operating system on these different devices, see how the app runs without me having to install anything. So yeah, it's gonna be just less time consuming in itself. So virtualization, one aspect is virtual machines. Now let's zoom in on this person here. Can't remember what I called him, Joe, I think it was. So little Joe on their phone is running the app I gave them. Now one piece of crucial hardware inside the app is RAM. Let's imagine that I've given them far the app, the coding app, is really powerful and it takes up a lot of space in the RAM. This purple represents the coding app. Uh oh, it's far too much for my RAM on this phone. What happens next is this concept of virtual memory. What this allows is this app to still run my phone, anything which is taking up too much space in the RAM is put into this virtual memory instead. And when I need to use this little bit of the app, it will send it into the RAM and replace it with what I'm not using anymore. That is another process of virtualization, virtual memory. So it basically means that my computer, my phone can still run without it having to crash, without it slowing down ridiculously, without me having to go and buy more RAM for my phone or for my student's phone so that they can run this app. Virtual memory kicks in. We then have another concept. So let's bring up another student. So let's bring up this person here. On their computer, <coughs> their desktop is not actually linked to their computer. It's not, so all the data is actually kept on my server. So all the apps they see on their desktop, all the different shortcuts actually are kept on here. So let's imagine you've got WhatsApp, let's imagine you've got the coding app I gave them, Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, PowerPoint, and Excel. They actually live here. So WhatsApp, the coding app, um, Microsoft Excel, etc. And I can have multiple students on their desktop actually using my server instead of their own desktop. When they decide to go on the coding app, so we double click on coding app here, it actually runs it on here instead of their computer. It passes it back to them. It looks like it's running on their machine, so they can see it. But it's been ran on the server. If I want to then, let's imagine, delete WhatsApp from the school computers. If I delete it here, it deletes it on their desktop as well because they're actually using my desktop. If I want to update the coding app because there's a new patch out, a new update, I can just update it here by clicking update and it will update it on there and there as well. So we call this a virtual desktop infrastructure. And the advantages of this are that 
It's easy for IT departments to deploy. That means give new apps, to delete apps, to update apps. Also, it allows powerful apps to be ran on not so good computers because they're ran on the server. So that basically means that I could come in with a really old Samsung phone from about eight years ago, connect to the virtual desktop and run the app without any issues. This is really good. Also, another benefit is it increases security. It increases security because no one can alter what's on this server. People can't install their own apps. Only the admin can. So that's three different types of virtualization I've talked about. I've talked about virtual machines, I've talked about virtual memory, and now virtual desktops. But there's a couple more things I like to discuss. Let's have a look at them. Something similar to virtual desktop is virtual apps, virtual applications. I put the word here. So again, linked to the virtual desktop, the coding app, I've installed it on the server, not on their computers. That is called a virtual application. They'll be accessing it virtually. Their device will think it's being run on their machine, but it's not, it's being run on the server. This basically means that computer power is being saved. So saves, I'm gonna put comp power. It means that we don't need to have increased local storage. Allow me to explain. Let's imagine that these computers are five years old. They've got one gig of hard drive space. This new app I brought, the coding app, takes up 10 gigs. I would have to go to the shop and for every computer buy more hard drive space or a bigger hard drive. That will cost me lots of money. But I don't need to do that if I'm using a virtual application because I just put it onto the server and then these guys can access it as long as they're connected to this network. So the same benefits of virtual applications are the same as virtual desktop. It means that the apps can be updated centrally, it can be managed centrally. Computing power is going to be less needed. Storage is going to be less needed because it's all done on the server. So we've got virtual applications, virtual desktop infrastructure, virtual memory, virtual machines. But what else can we talk about? Well, so what we're going to be looking at now is something similar to what we looked at in the previous lesson. We're looking at storage, but this time we're looking at a concept called virtual storage. So previously we looked at things like RAID, etc. and SAN, but this time we're just looking at this concept called virtual storage. So what do we have? Well, we've got physical disks, physical SSDs. So in your computer, you normally have one SSD. This is like for a big network. So we've got lots of different solid state drives. Each one, let's imagine, has a maximum of 50 gigabytes. So that's storing 50 gigabytes. We can save to it and stuff like that. Happy days. We then have this thing called a virtual disk. This is where we're going to be or our computer thinks it's saving to here and it's not saving it to here. But why would we want that? Well, here's the thing. If I, st let's, I'm gonna use video games as my example because it's easy to get your head around. I've got on this hard drive, Valorant. <coughs> I've got on this one, Hogwarts Legacy. So I'm just going to do Hogwarts Legacy. I've got another game called Baldur's Gate 3. It is worth 75 gigabytes. But uh oh, this is 50 gigabytes, this is 50 gigabytes. We've got a problem because it Baldur's Gate 3 doesn't fit here, it's not enough room. Baldur's Gate 3 doesn't fit here, it's not enough room. But I could save it to let's say here, Baldur's Gate 3. I can make this virtual disk 75 gigabytes out of 200. I'll then give this one 
um, 50 because for Valorant. But I might also actually make it 100 to fit Tug Wars Legacy. So both these two are going to be saved on this one. So 100, 175, and this one, 15 gigabytes. So I can save it for some other things. This will allow me to install Baldur's Gate to my computer without any issues. I won't be able to install it if I didn't have virtual disks because it won't fit here and it won't fit here. So it just won't work. I'd have to go to the shop and buy, replace this SSD with like 100 gigabytes or whatever. But using virtual disks, I've installed it here. The computer thinks it's installed here, but actually it's installing a bit here and a bit here, it shares it. To the computer, it doesn't matter about it split it because it sees it as one 75 gigabyte here. That's how it works. So virtual disks give us this flexible allocation of resources. It's not fixed in terms of size. I can customize how many gigabytes I want. It then shares the load. It puts it into what's called a pool, a storage pool. So it puts the data into the storage pool. It's shared across these physical disks, but the computer only talks to these virtual disks. These virtual disks aren't real. They are fake. Please keep in mind though, that we couldn't have a situation where, let's say this was 50, this was 50, this was 50, and this was 50, that this was 400. It won't work. We need this to match all of these combined. <coughs> so it gives us the flexibility. It makes it easy for us, in all honesty, for backup and recovery. Because I can just back up my virtual disks. Let me just give it up 400. So let's imagine that we have the Baldur's Gate here, Baldur's Gate 3 here, and we have it stored here and here. It's harder to back up if it's in two places. But if I back it up here on the virtual disk, Easy as one, two, three. So the physical disk has limitations. Fits capacity, harder to back up. Whereas in this virtual disk system, they do work with the physical disks, but it's easy to do things like resource allocation, backing up, etc. So easy for me to manage. All of these are working together, these physical disks. So I might only need, let's just get at that and that, I only might need just one virtual disk and put everything onto this. All of these work together to feed it. So this would have 200 in here. That is where we're talking about the storage pool. By doing all of this, we can actually increase performance of how fast it takes us to save things and load things up. You as a user, as a person using this, don't really care about this part. You don't need to know where it's saved. You just want to click save. And know it has been saved without any issues. <coughs> so this is virtual storage. So we talked about virtual storage. We've talked about virtual applications. We've talked about virtual desktop. Um, infrastructure and we talked about virtual machines. All of these are part of virtualization. And there's one more thing I am going to talk about. Finally, we have this concept called hosted instances. So hosted instances is linked to when we talked about virtual machines earlier. So we've got a physical computer, physical PC. The aim of a virtual machine is to act like this actual physical PC. So virtual machines work on physical hardware. So if I've got a virtual machine computer here, I'm gonna have RAM, I'm gonna have a CPU inside of it, I'm gonna have ROM inside of it as well, I'm gonna have SSD, a hard drive inside of it. And what happens is an instance is created. An instance is basically a slice of the virtual, uh, sorry, of the physical computer. So let me just draw this out. This is one big computer, PC, or server. I'm going to create a virtual machine here, instance. 
This is going to run Windows 95 because I want to play a really old game. I'm going to create another slice. This is going to run Windows 11. My actual computer itself is running Windows 10. But why would companies want to do this whole point of hosted instances, especially on servers? So let me give you an example of why. We've got a server where lots of people access my website. Let's imagine it's a um, shopping website. Throughout the year, my customer rate is like this. But then all of a sudden Christmas comes and I get loads of people. During the low demand, like here, I'm going to be running a server. But this server is going to be, let's create an instance of it, so slice. And this instance is going to be set up to handle like normal low traffic for me. It deals with the traffic of my website. All of a sudden, I get a surge in web traffic. What I can do is quite easily set up more instances. This then can deal with all the customers. So this will deal with the customers, this will also, so it manages the load. Now here's the thing. This is a virtual server. It means it's not real. It sits on a real server. So let me just show you. If I wasn't using a virtual server, or should I say a hosted instance, I'd have a server like this. Low traffic, it can deal with. But all of a sudden, I start getting high traffic. Uh-oh, it can't cope and it crashes. What I'd have to do is buy another server and possibly have to buy another server. The issue with all of this is that they're not working together, they're separate, and it costs me a lot of money in order to do that. But what I can do is very simple with a virtual one. I can pay for a server. So an actual physical server. But I'm going to just use a part of that and pay for a part of that, an instance. If I need more instances because of my demand going up, like here, I can create another instance on that server and pay for that as well. But I don't need to pay for anything else, which I'm not using. That allows me also to do what's called dynamic scaling, where it automatically adds instances if I need them. So let's imagine that my sales are going even higher. Uh-oh, we need another instance, another basic server. So each instance thinks is its own server. But actually, they all sit on the same server itself. So this is a virtual server, this is a virtual server, a virtual one. They all think they're... That their own server machines, but they're not. So to follow on from hosted instances, we have what's known as hosted uh, solutions. This is basically tied to what we've just spoken about. Basically, in this situation, my business called Levin Shop, I rent server space. So I rent a server space from a third party. So I rent basically a server from a third party, a company. Basically, what they do is not only do they lease out the server, but they also take responsibility for the security of the server. So this third party is responsible for security, but also responsible for the maintenance and the management of it. So if I zoom out right now, when we talked about virtualization, 
wow, this is really messy, but who cares? We talked about virtual machines. We talked about virtual desktop infrastructure. We talked about virtual applications. We talked about virtual storage. We then talked about hosted instances on a server, and then we talked about the hosted solution. This makes up virtualization. But I'm now going to introduce you to one more concept to basically work alongside this. So this concept is called clustering. So I want you to picture loads of not very powerful computers all working together to create one super computer. So Pixar, for example, have a supercomputer, the animation company. We'll call this the supercomputer. All of these machines, which Pixar have, which is actually um, 2000, are all working together. And they use that to render their movies, so basically to put their movies together to turn their animations, so let's do that, then the next frame is gonna be the character walking a little bit, then the next character, the frame, the character's falling over. I should work for Pixar. It puts each one of these frames, it renders it, which means it puts it all together to create, put it into a movie, but their movies are so powerful, it needs to use cluster computing. So less powerful machines, all working together as a network to create one powerful machine. That is clustering or cluster computing. <coughs> so we've got clustering, but we've also got a concept called cloud computing, which is slight different to cloud storage and let me just show you this in action that's probably the easiest thing this website here is an app its job is to turn documents into PDF so if I click on that create but I don't need to have this software on my computer it doesn't need to be on my computer the actual app itself is stored on the cloud. I can put Word documents and I can also turn them into PDFs as well. So what is cloud computing? Well, it uses what's called a layer of abstraction. So we can call this um, the server. Actually, let's change this diagram slightly. This is my PC here. My PC, I want to be using this PDF editor. So I access the server. I then put on my upload whatever I want to do, let's say my Word document, onto the server. What happens next is the cloud service turns it into a PDF once the conversion is done it's sent back to the server as a PDF let me download it onto my PC the layer of abstraction is the cloud service itself it takes away all the complexities about the conversion I don't need to know how it's done the server doesn't need to know how it's done. The server just runs the software. It just turns it from Word to PDF and it's done for me. That's why cloud computing is so useful. The app is run on the server. It does a job. The cloud service, which converts it, does all the complexities for me. My life is easy. So we talked about how Pixar use clustering or cluster computing. And we talked about cloud computing. The final thing, 
is now a combination of cluster and cloud computing. The amazing cloud cluster, well oh, actually I got it the wrong way around, cluster cloud, my bad, cluster cloud computing. So it's combining these two aspects together. So let me give you a scenario. Let's imagine that in your house you've got thousands of family photos, digital ones. These are people, by the way, over the years. And what you want to do is you want to organize these photos based on what's going on in the photo. Let's imagine that we're doing it without cloud cluster, cluster cloud computing. I keep saying that all around. So you might use one PC. All these photos are on this one PC. But this PC, using some software, let's say some AI, to go through every photo may take forever. It might run out of RAM, or you might run out of storage because you've got too many photos. Let's now use cloud, cluster cloud computing as the same example. So we've got the photos, but instead of us just doing it on a local PC, what we're gonna do is that we find a cloud service online that does this for us. We upload the photos to this service. Very simple. It then, the cloud service using loads of computers, remember what clustering does, low powerful computers or low power computers, all work together to create a supercomputer to create, to basically do the service, which is organize the photos, which then allows me to download the photos once they've been organized. The layer of abstraction is the cloud service again, which was responsible for basically organizing, well, recognizing and organizing the photos in the first place and let's say creating albums from them. The AI aspect. I don't need to care about how the service works. So that's why it's a layer of abstraction. It's a cloud service. So we're putting it online to an online server where it's got like an online app, application on the server, whose job is to organize these photos and it's using cluster computers where you've got loads of low powerful computers which all work together. As you can see, the benefit of this is that you can have high processing power. I don't need to. If I did it on my own PC, it's going to take all my resources to do it. My CPU might not be powerful enough to do it quickly, so it'll be really slow. If we're combining all these computers together to create one supercomputer to do it, still a computer here, it's going to create a really powerful CPU. It's going to give it a lot of RAM, so it's going to give it a lot of resources to do it quickly and it's going to have a lot of storage so i don't have to buy any more storage if i run out it's not putting the pressure on my pc it's putting the pressure on this cloud computer instead so everything together on this side of things we've looked at the following we've looked at the concept of virtualization we've also looked at clustering oh, i'm going off screen We looked at the concept of cloud and the relationship between cloud and clustering. 